late again. I can't get another detention. Seriously, I cannot get another detention. Oh, them? Hi, I'm Melissa Rivers and welcome. Holocaust Museum LA provides free Holocaust education to students and visitors from around the world. It is the oldest Holocaust museum in the country and the first museum founded by survivors as a space where photographs, documents, and personal items could be stored not only safely, but in perpetuity. They also wanted to create a place to remember those who perished and more importantly, educate the public to ensure the truth survives. The museum's story began in the late 1950s when a group of survivors met while taking an English class at a high school, just like this. Melissa Rivers to homeroom, Melissa Rivers to homeroom. Wait again. Holocaust Museum LA is open seven days a week, and admission is always free for all students and to all California residents. Since opening in 2010, the museum has welcomed half a million visitors, plus, get this, more than 50,000 virtual visitors this past year. 80% of the student visitors come from Title I schools with programs that are designed to foster empathy and critical thinking about contemporary issues. Through tours, exhibitions, educational programs, and conversations with survivors, the museum teaches all of its visitors to stand against anti-Semitism, bigotry, and hatred by teaching critical lessons of the Holocaust. These lessons are more relevant than ever, particularly for anyone in any community that has been marginalized or ostracized. We gotta remember, it's a human story, not just a Jewish story. When the museum closed its doors last year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the staff and board quickly mobilized to provide meaningful virtual education programs and online resources to keep the students, the docents, the survivors, and the public informed, engaged, and connected. It was completely uncharted territory. You know, nobody had been in this situation before. It was something that we just had to kind of navigate and throw ourselves in the deep end and do the best that we could really. During COVID we pivoted to virtual education and in the 2020 to 2021 um, school year we had over 28,000 student participants. Typically in a normal school year we would reach a capacity of about 20,000. Um, so yes, definitely pivoting to virtual helped us uh, reach other regions that we wouldn't have had otherwise. We've outreached to schools not only in Southern California, but uh, even schools as far as Alaska and Missouri. We also had a virtual programming in Mexico, which was also very incredible. Listening to them later say that they were very grateful to listen to someone who went through something much worse than they are going through now, really inspired them to be upstanders and leave as a witness to the Holocaust, which is, of course, our biggest mission here. We had lots of students who really resonated with a lot of the stories that the survivors shared, which in turn made them write beautiful comments like, thank you for sharing your story with us. You've brought a different light to the Holocaust history, which is it's a little bit more um, touching to a lot of students because they get to hear this. And they also are very aware that they might be, this is the last generation that many of them will get to listen to, which is um, very empowering as students to know we want to empower young people to think that any discrimination, any hatred has no space. And so part of this produced a really beautiful intergenerational program where we took an eighth grade class that attends a Jewish day school here in Los Angeles and an eighth grade class that attends a Title I school here in Los Angeles and connected them over the course of four months. So these students would meet virtually and they heard from Holocaust survivors together, they toured the museum together and they had really deep conversations about what the social relevancy of the Holocaust is to each of them. And there was this beautiful cross collaboration of cultures and identities that produced a community zine that's now hosted on our website and if you read the scene and see the artwork and poems the students created you can really understand how having conversations with people who are not in our circles or in our spheres or in our neighborhoods about the past can inspire a more dignified present and future 
For students today, the Holocaust is very far in the past. It feels as if it was a different world before Twitter and Instagram, social media, the internet. And I think year over year, what really connects students with this history is meeting a Holocaust survivor and meeting another human being who experienced something that doesn't feel like history anymore when you hear them say that. And really in the last year, I think even more so students would hear Holocaust survivors talk about what it was like to be in hiding during the Holocaust, to be stuck at home, to have no one to talk to, to be teenagers themselves. And I think students really connected with this in a unique way and in a way that inspired them to rethink the circumstances of our present. It's very hard to kind of visualize this number of, of six million people being murdered, but to work with the incredible collection that the museum has and the students that come every day and the Holocaust survivors that, you know, tell their history uh, really kind of humanizes that number and allows you to kind of really understand that this happened to people just like us and people who had families and lives and, you know, really kind of allows you to connect on a human level with those stories. We are a history museum, and how do you take artifacts and primary sources and make them virtual and accessible to people who live in Los Angeles and who live abroad? So one of the ways that we delved into that is both by partnering with other organizations, by turning some of our exhibits virtual, and reimagining what a history museum means virtually. So from making a 360 degree tour of the museum that was exploratory and available to making PowerPoint slides that literally walk people through the exhibit space, we were thinking outside of the box constantly, which kind of led us to think about a virtual program where we could take visitors behind our locked doors of our archive, a space that visitors are never allowed previously. And so we started this series called Inside the Acid-Free Box, referencing the acid-free boxes that are used in archives to preserve documents and primary sources. And this launched as a series every single month where we invite the public to see what's behind a locked door of a museum, see what's in the vault, see what's in the archive, and explore these primary sources that are never exhibited in the museum. This is a history of human beings and the capacity that they can do to one another, whether it be horrific things or also really heroic things. Um, and I think it, the more we focus with students on how we can all be better versions of ourselves, that will ultimately lead to a brighter future. I think that definitely to have achieved what we've been able to achieve in the last 12 to 18 months and all of the new programming, the new students we've reached, you know, all of these new incredible things that we've been able to accomplish, it definitely makes me proud. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what is next and, and kind of what the future holds. David Lango was born in 1927 in Łódź, Poland. David remained in the Łódź ghetto until it was liquidated in 1944. He was sent to Auschwitz and then to a labor camp in Bavaria. He was liberated by U.S. troops in May 1945. My name is David Lenga. My brother Nathan and I grew up in a very loving, caring family. I was always an outgoing boy and surrounded myself with many close friends. My wonderful childhood came to an abrupt end on September the 1st, 1939. I was only 11 years old when Hitler's army invaded Poland. My life then entered a nightmare. What followed, in short, was persecution, brutality, separation of families, incarceration in ghettos and extermination camps like Auschwitz, Dachau, and Kaufering. I was through six years of living hell of war. I survived by the skin of my teeth and by sheer luck. I lost my entire family of close to 100 people. And I was so fortunate to find out later, after liberation, that my dad also survived the war. Only two survivors out of 100. I was liberated by the American Army on May the 5th, 1945, and I was only 17 years old then. We must never forget what happened. Donate to Holocaust Museum LA to ensure that the truth survives. Just click the button below. Thank you.
I am pleased to now introduce one of our esteemed honorees, the extremely talented, internationally acclaimed photographer, humanitarian, and philanthropist, Judy Glickman Lauder. Over the past 30 years, Judy has captured the intensity of the death camps in Germany, Poland, and Czechoslovakia in these dark and expressive photographs, revealing a world that was turned upside down. Two years ago, Holocaust Museum LA was proud to present Judy's work, Beyond the Shadows, The Holocaust and the Danish Exception. Judy is widely published, both nationally and internationally. Her work is held at over 300 private collections and public institutions around the world, including the Getty, the Whitney, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I am so excited. Welcome, Judy. Thank you. How are you? I am doing really beautifully. I feel so incredibly grateful to be honored by the Holocaust Museum LA. I have so many questions for you. Oh, let's do it. Okay, starting with what was your initial inspiration for not just visiting, but documenting the actual sites of Holocaust period history? Wow, okay, going way back, my Jewish heritage has always been really important to me. And growing up, my background is uh, my family's all from Poland, from Lithuania, and from the Ukraine. I have always been involved in photography. And actually, many years ago, one of the early Holocaust museums, the Martyrs Museum of the Holocaust, uh, right here on Wilson Boulevard, it was part of the Federation. It was really the early roots for the uh, Holocaust Museum LA. And I was asked to photograph uh, all the objects in the museum and all of the survivors who put together the museum. And uh, during that time, Elie Wiesel came and spoke and I was able to photograph him. So I became very interested. Then I had an opportunity to actually go to the camps. How did you decide which camps to visit and really focus on? Sadly, there was a lot to choose from. There's a lot to choose from. You're right, you're right. I picked groups that were going to different camps. It was over a three year period. So I ended up going to probably eight or 10, maybe more different camps in Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, all over the, everywhere. So I, it was direct, I knew where I wanted to go and I went with groups and, but being a photographer, I always sort of left the groups and kind of meandered and tried to document what I was seeing and what I was feeling. How emotional was it? And it, I guess the question really is, was it more emotional photographing the camps or when you got home and had to start to edit? Oh, that's a good question. It was very emotional. Uh, being in the camps was very emotional. Uh, coming home, of course, this is all film and dark room and everything. So I had a lot of time to go through everything and see what my feelings were at that time. And I felt that my black and white film was two kinds of film, straight black and white and also infrared, black and white infrared film, was really expressing my feelings. It was kind of haunted. And I actually, when I was in those camps, I kind of felt uh, at one with the souls who had departed. It was kind of, uh, it became a mission for me to actually keep going back and keep photographing. Beyond the Shadows focuses quite a bit on the moment of rescue. That's gotta be such a poignant thing to not just photograph, but to feel? Was it a sense of relief that came through your lens? Was it a sense of toughness and surviving? Because I would think it would, a lot of mixed emotions would be coming through the lens. I don't know how else to put it. You're right. <laughs> uh, definitely. First of all, uh, I was asked to go to Denmark to try to put together an exhibit it was going to be the 50th year of the Danish rescue. 
it, uh, the Danes were um, occupied in 1941. The rescue came in 43, and they won an exhibit in 93. So I went there, and the emotion that I felt was just one of incredible, a breath of fresh air, an incredible admiration, a smile totally hit my face. I was able to interview, photograph many, many rescuers, people in resistance, uh, survivors themselves, and they took me to sites where everything happened. And I was on boats that got them actually over to the, through the Or Sound, over to Sweden. And uh, it was an incredibly uplifting, hopeful, happy experience. How does the particular story of Denmark resonate today? I mean, we are living in such divisive and difficult times. It really resonates today, probably because during World War II, it was all fear and evil and everything was happening. And Elie Wiesel had a quote that during that time, you reach the summit of humanity by remaining human. In other words, the Danes really, they just knew what to do. They had the bravery and the moral courage to do it. And it just proves that in our world today, man can make a difference. And as you're saying, we are going through really troubled times right now. And this story is, it really resonates 100%. The Holocaust Museum LA, what they are doing is such incredible, important work. They are reaching people of every age. It's what is needed in this world today, 100%. Judy, thank you so much for all you do. And right now, I would like to introduce my friend, Beth Keen, the CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. Judy, your work is brilliant. You've been an advocate for this museum for decades, and we were so honored to showcase your photographs. Your work educates diverse audiences on the continued relevance of the Holocaust. You show the dangers of hatred and bigotry and the importance of courage and resilience. You embody the museum's vision of inspiring humanity through truth. On behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, it is truly my honor to present this award for your tireless commitment to Holocaust education and helping to ensure the truth survives. Oh my goodness, this is so meaningful and very, very heartfelt, very deep, meaningful to me, uh, especially being honored with people that I know, with uh, Melinda and with Andrea, whose family I've known and admired for so many years. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone. At, at Holocaust Museum LA. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti, and it's so great to join you in the celebration of the Holocaust Museum LA and to congratulate this evening's amazing honorees, Judy glickman Lauder, Melinda Goldrich, and Andrea Kitten. Judy has made it her life's work to make sure we never forget the Holocaust. An exceptionally talented photographer, her work can be seen all over the world including at the Holocaust Museum LA. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us, Judy. And Melinda and Andrea, two amazing Angelinos who work so hard every day to ensure that the voices, stories, and photographs of this museum continue to be heard, seen, and felt. Thank you both for all you do. Their father, the late Jonah Goldrich, my dear friend, is the reason this extraordinary museum exists. I'll never forget when Jonah, a survivor, came to city council more than a decade ago, seeking a permanent home for the museum when I was city council president. It was such an honor to be involved, along with my dear friend, the late Tom LaVange, in those early days of the museum, to figure out how we can take this museum's inspiring work and mission and carry it forward, so that the lessons of the past can help our city be more just, more ethical, and more compassionate. We got it done, and today, the museum is an incredible place. 
So thank you to the staff and the leadership, the executive committee, the donors and the volunteers for all you do in the heart of LA to tell this critical human story, to connect us with knowledge, but also to propel us in action. You truly are a gift to our city of angels. Ava Nathanson was born in Budapest in 1941. When she was a child, pro-Nazi Arrow Cross party members arrested most of her family. A friend rescued Ava and provided her with shelter. My name is Ava Nathanson. By the time I was born, my father, Moses Adam, was in a first labor camp. He escaped to bring me a doll for my first birthday in January 1942. To punish him, the Nazis put him to hard labor and then murdered him when he got sick and could not work. I never really met my father. I was barely two years old when the Nazis came and arrested most of my family. I was staying with my grandfather, who was working with underground saving Jews. My governess dressed me in peasant clothes and hid me from the captures. She smuggled me to where my mother was running my father's business in Budapest. The rest of the war, we hid various homes. I still fear soldiers, weapons, and small spaces. I want my grandkids to grow up in a world without hate. I speak to students at the museum because I am worried what would happen if children did not understand what hatred and bigotry can do. Education will conquer ignorance. Please click below to donate, now so that we may ensure that truth survives. Jonah Golders was born in 1927 in Turka, Poland. His childhood was upended first by the Soviet Union in 1939 and then by Nazi Germany in 1941. His parents made the difficult decision to separate the family, which they thought would guarantee them a better chance of survival. With the help of a paid Catholic guide, Jonah and his younger brother Avram traveled to Hungary where they were absorbed into a school and able to hide their Jewish identities. Sadly, Jonah's parents and older brother Isaac and most of their extended family were murdered by the Nazis while attempting a similar escape. Eventually, the two brothers made their way to British Palestine in 1942 and later fought in the 1948 War of Independence for the establishment of the State of Israel. In his mid-twenties, Jonah arrived in the United States with a bus ticket and $50 in his pocket. He headed to Los Angeles and went on to co-found one of Southern California's largest real estate development and management companies. In 1992, he was one of the visionaries in the creation and dedication of the Holocaust Monument, as well as the establishment of Holocaust Museum LA's permanent home in Pan Pacific Park. Joining me now are Jonah's daughters, Melinda Goldrich and Andrea Caton, who are carrying forward their father's legacy in creating Holocaust education and repairing the world through philanthropy. Andrea lives in Los Angeles and serves on the executive committee of Holocaust Museum LA. Melinda resides in Aspen, Colorado and also serves on the board of Holocaust Museum LA. I am so happy to be sitting here with you guys. I want to talk about your dad's childhood. Did he talk about it often? Because like my father did not talk about the Holocaust and what his family went through. He was very closed about it to the point where he wouldn't even speak German. Well, he spoke it in the German deli ordering, but that was it. Did your dad share his experiences or was he very closed off about it? My dad liked to tell anyone who would listen that he was Jewish and that he came from Israel, but he wouldn't necessarily, or Poland, he would say. Sometimes Israel, sometimes Poland. But he would say, if someone said, what's your nationality, he'd go Jewish. Really? He made Jewish a nationality. Really? Thought, and, and then when people would say, but where are you from? And where is your accent from? And he would be like, oh, well, Poland. Or sometimes he would answer Israel. But he I'm Jewish. He considered himself an Israeli. OK, but did, you know, a lot of survivors, they either really do want to share and talk about it, or they don't want to talk about it at all. He liked to talk about it with other people, but not with us and not in detail. He kind of brushed over it and would throw, insert a few things. He would reference a few things to people, but he would never, was not specific, and he kind of emotionally shut down when, by, in, with us and wouldn't talk about it. I think that's fascinating, because that's my experience with my dad. Yet, your father was incredibly active within the Jewish community and incredibly philanthropic. 
So what that's definitely at the it's a di different dichotomy. It's a little bit at odds with each other. I think of him as leading by example, not by teaching. What he did and what he did in the community, what he did through business and financially contributing to things is how he taught us, very, as I call man it. Man of very, very few words. He expected us to just know and do without explanation. We were just supposed to no. like, just figure it out. It's interesting. Very much the same experiences that I uh, that I had with my dad. And, and something we have talked about in the past is how my father always said that education was so important because it was the one thing they can't take away from you. And you guys have said that your dad sort of had a very similar sentiment. He had a sentence that was, the only thing they can't take away from you is what's inside your head. It's the same idea. Do I mean, think, it's the same philosophy. I mean, it doesn't take, you know, Psych 101 tells you it's because of the constant loss that these men experienced as children. And did you ever get the sense of fear from your dad that no matter how successful he got, things could always just suddenly be taken away? Yes. He, um, well, he was very thrifty with his own items and how he lived, and so I think that was worried that was he was going to lose stuff. So I think the less he had, didn't have to worry about it. You're lighter, like a lighter like load. load. Like you could always run. You could always leave. And also not to have emotional attachment. He didn't to wasn't emotional to things. They didn't. They weren't important. Things were not important. Yet he was willing to take people out to dinner. He was generous. Right. He would, he would, you know, he was very philanthropic. But he didn't like to spend money on things. things. He didn't, and he didn't want people to think he was spending money on things. It was all kind of a what people perceived of him. Your family has been incredibly generous with the museum. How much does it, seeing the vision that your father was part of the beginning of really not only come to life but just grow and grow and grow? I think that. Um, the fact that he didn't ever expect it to get so much bigger and that it's just really blossomed is amazing because he just wanted to get to a few people. He never really thought of it as a global thing or is it a nationwide thing. So I think it's amazing that what his vision was kind of narrow, but yet it's just grown and it keeps growing. And in today's world, it's just so much more important. So I, I always think about what he would think today and um, how proud he would be of especially the people that are working at the museum because they're extremely dedicated and loyal and he, that's what he liked. The future. You guys have so much going on and really exciting things going on at the museum. Will you share some of that with us? I think uh, the future when it comes to education and Holocaust education includes a lot of technology that was definitely out of my reach and out of my father's reach or our father's reach for sure. Um, the future of education is important when you tie it to the present and the future uh, for people's children and beyond. And that has included really documenting through virtual technology and taking testimony and projecting it onto screens and three-dimensional screens. I think that's the only way to preserve the past and take it forward. Andrew and I are both involved in a lot of other organizations mm -hmm. that do ho Holocaust education, and they have have a similar mission. Shoah Foundation. The USC Shoah Foundation, uh, the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation, all the different Jewish institutions that we participate mm -hmm. in all have that same job ahead of them. We want to all be partners together, so it's important that we include that if we do one project, we kind of include the, incorporate the other ones and tie it all in together. A lot of synergy that right. everybody's it's, on it's the really same It's really important that we're track. all on the same page. And your children. I have three children. And how are you impressing upon them the importance that they take it to the next level? Well, I remind them all the time that they're a grandchild of a survivor and that it's their, my dad's legacy that they have to carry on and to help fight hatred, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and to take the past and make it relevant to the present and the future. And this is their hometown, and they're, I think they're, gonna, they're all back here. So I think it's really important that they be grounded here and they continue that. And I feel like they will, they're, they're on their way, and I think they have a ba basic understanding, and I really know that they're gonna do it because I've embedded it into them that that's important to them. What's interesting is you guys have said that your dad 
didn't want his name on anything while he was alive. And so since his passing, you guys have sort of put his name on everything in his honor, including the new Jonah Goldrich campus at the museum. So I think <laughs> it's important that my dad's name is carried on because it was his it was his vision his work. and his experiences that led us to have this journey. And he needs to be honored. And the, really the way to honor that, that is to give someone's name on a building or a, in a room or whatever. I think it's important because he was really Visionary. a major force in the, especially the LA community. And people know him and they'll be like, oh, I knew your dad. And they come up to me and they say, he's done so much for this community, for the city. And he really deserves it. And I, it's, I, I don't need my name, I need his name. And I'm proud to, to mention that I'm Jonah's daughter. He was a unique human being, and there are, they don't make him like that anymore. What was the, what's the funniest memory that you have growing up of your dad? Well, his ski outfits were unique. Yeah, my he father. Would mix, mix, mix and match all different kinds of things. He didn't really care what it looked like. And I think he, the shower cap. And he, yes, he swam with a, Shower cap. He swam in public pools and places. Not to get his hair wet because he thought he thought that if he got his hair too wet, he would lose it. He met. He had a hair. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Back yeah. up. Back there's up. A, there's, so a, there's, there's more a lot to this of them, right. story. So yeah. So <laughs> okay. Yeah. Your dad swam in a yeah. swimming cap or no. a shower, shower cap? A clear shower cap like, like a cheap, hotel. The cheap ones that come folded up in the but little then, the freebies. But the shower and cap he, thing was based on a hairdresser that told him the less you get your hair wet, the less it falls out. So he really believed that. And he swam with his head out of the water, and you would just see oh, this Oh, the man. woman, the, the old yes. lady country club swim. Yeah. Yes. All those ladies, when they swim with their head, because they don't want to have to go to the hairdresser again. Yes. But when he visited me in Aspen, or we went on a family cruise ship, he would forget that he had the shower cap on and leave <laughs> the pool area and, and walk around. And people were like, oh, I saw your dad at the gym in a shower cap yesterday. <laughs> he was quite a character. He didn't care about appearances. Clearly. At all. At all. Ever. <laughs> the name Jonah Goldrich is so synonymous now with Holocaust education. How important is it that we continue to educate the next generations? Well, I know his fear, and certainly our fear, is that as the survivors die off, and we're down to really the last few, that it's an open door for Holocaust denial, and that in turn is an open door for bigotry and prejudice and racism and anti Semitism. So it's really important now to expand the education forum. And you're doing that at the museum. It is just growing and growing and growing. And yes, and to make it more relevant to today, because it's, it's getting, as the time goes on, it's becoming, oh, that's history. So you have to take what we learned from the Holocaust and make it applic applicable to today, what's going on today, so that people can understand how, what did we learn from the Holocaust, and how can we apply it to today? So that's really what's important, is educate, taking the education that we learned, why it happened, and the mindset of people, and applying it in today's world. And that's, you know, what you do with history, is how you apply it to today, modern times. Fascinating. I am so excited to be able to introduce my friend, who is your friend too, Beth Keane. Thank you. For this important presentation. Andrea and Melinda, your dedication and commitment to Holocaust Museum LA is unwavering. As board members, you are fierce advocates for the museum. You've been instrumental in solidifying our partnership with USC Shoah Foundation, which has led to the museum hosting incredible experiences such as The Last Goodbye and now Dimensions in Testimony. The Goldrich and Caton Family Foundations are the museum's most generous benefactors, ensuring that the museum not only thrives, but also stays on the cutting edge. Your transformational lead gift to the museum's expansion project will allow us to break ground on the Jonah Goldrich campus next year. Personally, first as a fellow board member and now as CEO, you've been inspiring to work with, and I am so lucky to be able to call you both true friends. On behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, I am honored to present to you the first annual Jonah Goldrich Visionary Award. I know that Jonah is smiling right now. Your father always said that he was fighting against forgetting, 
and would be so proud that you are carrying on his legacy to ensure the truth survives. Thank you, Beth. It couldn't be done without you and the rest of the staff at Holocaust Museum LA, so it's very meaningful to be receiving this award from you, so thank you again. And I just think what you guys do and contribute, I know the museum is grateful, but I think everyone who has the opportunity to come and experience the museum is incredibly grateful as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so you. much. Standing beside the pillars of the Holocaust Memorial Monument reminds us of the history of how this whole museum came to be. For me, one of the most moving parts of the museum is right here at the Goldrich Family Foundation Children's Memorial. Each one of these holes represents the almost 1.5 million children who died in the Holocaust. It's a staggering number and one of the many reasons why Holocaust education is so critically important. There are so many new and exciting exhibits coming. <clears throat> Josh, Josh Flagg? That's me. What are you doing here? Fancy seeing you here, Melissa. I know, so everybody come meet Josh Flagg from Million Dollar Listing. Josh, everyone, everyone, Josh. Hi, honey, how are you? Good, how are you? What are you doing here? Well, I was just reliving my grandparents' history. I was reading more about them, and I was looking through all these fabulous photographs and these fabulous documents that we provided here to the museum. I can't believe this, but I don't know your grandparents' story. Well, it's pretty interesting. Uh, during the war, instead of uh, essentially hiding, my grandparents hid, but they also saved dozens of lives when they were in the Dutch underground. Uh, they saved dozens of lives during the Holocaust. In fact, my grandmother would go in the morning and swim the lakes to eavesdrop on the Nazis to see what their plans for the day were. So she would swim close enough? She would literally swim right next to the Nazis and they never knew that she was a Jew. How? Well, she just was a good swimmer. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have donated a lot of these artifacts. What do we have here? Well, after my grandmother passed away, my family donated most of the artifacts that we have from her time during the war. We have false identification papers, we have Startup David, we have letters, we have tons of photos, and in the vault upstairs here at the museum, we have just dozens and dozens of artifacts. This is amazing, but I gotta get back to class. Where are you off to? Well, I was about to go check out the USC Foundation's Dimension and Testimony installation. Have you seen it? No, is it good? It's really good. Can't wait to see it. This is the 3D virtual experience that allows you to have a real-time conversation with a Holocaust survivor. The survivor who is currently featured today is Renee Firestone. I met Renee a few years ago. She knew my grandmother, Edith Flagg. Both Renee and Edith became pioneers in the Los Angeles fashion industry when they immigrated here after the war. Let's go inside. Hello, Renee. Hi. This is very cool. Renee, what was it like in Auschwitz? Well, first of all, you know, when you say Auschwitz, Auschwitz has three different parts. But Birkenau was just a huge, huge camp where the barracks were lined up and each row of barracks was divided with a row of barbed wire and the barbed wires actually divided the camps. And uh, it was huge. I could sit here and ask Renee questions all day. This experience is such an innovative way to engage visitors, especially young people in Holocaust education, and allow them to continue to have conversations with survivors as we are approaching a post-survivor world. This interactive exhibit will become a permanent installation in a larger theater as part of the museum's new learning pavilion, but more on that expansion in a bit. Continuing on the theme of Holocaust Museum LA, being a leader and innovator in Holocaust education, they've also formed a partnership with Academy Award winning visual effects company, Magnopus, to bring the artifacts to life and make them accessible to anyone in the world using an augmented reality technology. It was a gift from Television City Studios and allowed the museum to create the first experience using the Sobibor model. This model was recreated from memory and built for the museum by Thomas Blatt, who escaped the Sobibor death camp when he was 16. 
Magnopa's creative director, Craig Barron, is here to actually show us how it works. Okay, thank you, Melissa. So the way this works is that if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you've downloaded the app, and basically what you do is you scan a table in your room, a surface, and then on that surface, the camp becomes a 3D graphical model that you can interact with. You can walk around it. It's as if it's a model sitting on your table and you can explore it. You know, when you, when you see a building, you can tap on it. The roof comes off and you can see what's going on inside. There is an engagement and an exploration that you have uh, by interacting with the VR experience. And this is a great way to teach and to educate and to have a sense of commitment and engagement that you're learning about something as it's being revealed to you. But you're in charge. You're deciding what you want to see at what time. What's really interesting about it from the standpoint of a museum is that museums traditionally are about going to a museum and interacting with an exhibit. This is an attempt to reach out beyond the walls of the museum itself. Really worldwide, anybody can download this experience and have this experience regardless of your proximity to the actual museum. You know, young people and students, they use technology like uh, computers and iPhones for their socialization, for their learning experiences, to the students that have responded very positively to it. So we're looking forward to completing the project and working closely with the museum in the future. Thank you, Craig. That's gonna be amazing. Hi, my name is Zach Sokoloff, Vice President at Hackman Capital Partners and Development Manager of our Television City Project. We're thrilled to partner with Holocaust Museum LA and Magnopus to leverage cutting edge digital media tools to expand access to some of the museum's most powerful exhibits. Fighting bigotry and hatred is of great importance to us at Hackman Capital and we hope our partnership can help educate museum goers about the past and inspire the next generation to be more tolerant and empathetic into the future. We're also proud to support HMLA's expansion plan as we reimagine Television City into a 21st century production studio. We're grateful to have community partners also working to support local organizations and businesses and helping to heal the Beverly Fairfax District. Click the button below to donate to Holocaust Museum LA and help ensure the truth survives. Thank you. Our mission to commemorate those who perished, honor those who survived, educate about the Holocaust, and inspire a more dignified and humane world has never been more important. In order to plan for the future, ensure the voices of our survivors live on in perpetuity, and address the rising tide of hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism, we have embarked on an expansion plan that will double the museum's footprint. This will allow us to amplify our reach and impact, increase our visibility, and solidify us as a world-class institution. And thanks to an extremely generous lead gift from the Kate and Goldrich families, the Jonah Goldrich campus will include a new learning center pavilion adjacent to the existing building on the Grove Drive, with a 200-seat state-of-the-art theater, a 30-seat Dimensions and Testimony theater, a large special exhibit gallery, two classrooms, and a gift shop, Grab and Go Cafe. The campus will feature outdoor spaces for reflection and showcase a new pavilion built on top of the existing building that will house an authentic boxcar from Poland. We are so fortunate that the museum's original architect and fellow board member, Hagi Belsberg, is designing this expansion for us. When we first designed the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, we never imagined more than 15,000 people attending a year. And through the last 10 years, the extraordinary success has allowed us to now design for that opportunity and create an iconic landmark for future generations. As you know, the existing museum was designed and built to really fit within the park landscape. With the new design, we are now able to stand proudly on Grove Drive and create more of a hierarchical entry, more of an iconic representation of the institution. The Boxcar Pavilion and its artifact as a central feature, will actually be able to be seen from the entire park. 
This is really, really important because it provides an idea of what may be happening inside our museum. But what's more important is how extraordinarily chilling and evocative the story is, even without the exhibit. But seeing this artifact in its full scale, in its full enormity, really will, I believe, set us apart from almost any museum of the same historical nature in the world. The new learning pavilion and its different assets are an extraordinary opportunity for our community. We really created a campus here, a multitude of pavilions. We have our existing museum, our learning center, we have a canopy over a beautiful open courtyard, the boxcar pavilion, all of these work together in sequence to allow a patron to maybe take their time and enjoy visiting and not feel a relentlessness of engaging exhibit after exhibit. We offer a pause in between. So these connections of buildings really do just work together in, the, in a really park-like way. And it's really, I, I would have to say, so appropriate for this environment. There's never been a more important project that I've worked on. And I'm so, so grateful to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you to the California Legislative Jewish Caucus for advocating on our behalf to secure eight and a half million dollars in funding from the state of California. The state funding reinforces the museum's important role in the community and the need to expand our impact. And also many thanks to the Stanley and Joyce Black Family Foundation for their leadership gift that brings the powerful boxcar artifact to the museum and to board member and survivor David Wiener and his wife Cheryl for sponsoring the exhibit that will share David's family story. We are working toward breaking ground on the Building Truth Expansion Project in January 2022 and to be open for business in the new space by January 2024. Visit hmla.org to see the latest progress on the project or to get involved. This expansion furthers our work to ensure the truth survives. Click below to donate now to support Holocaust Museum LA. I continue to be blown away by how Holocaust Museum LA is making an impact not only today, but also by its vision for the future. Please come for a tour, learn from a survivor, join a program either online or in person. Together we can carry forward survivor stories, learn from the lessons of the Holocaust, and stand up to anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry.
I mean, to be honest, I woke up really early for school this morning, so pretty much that's it for me.